Yeah, we should move to our next talk, uh, which is by René Garitsma. He is at the University of Amsterdam. Uh, so I'll give a brief um, um, overview of the, his trajectory. So he was, um, he did his, uh, he did his studies from the University of Groningen and then uh, followed by a PhD <laughs> from the van der, van der Waals Seaman yeah. Institute at the University of Amsterdam. Following that, he was in the Institute for Quantum Optic and Quantum Information, which is the Innsbruck in uh, Institute where he was with Rainer Blatt's group. Um, uh, following that, he had he moved to University of Mainz and he is now back to his old alma mater, uh, which is at the University of Amsterdam, the same institute. Uh, and uh, he is conducting some phenomenal experiments with ions in, in ion atom interactions and um, other things actually. So welcome Rene and- uh, yeah, Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, uh, thanks for the invitation. It's very nice to give this talk. So nice to hear some of the other talks um, by Matthias and uh, Johannes just, uh, just now. And uh, yeah, so, uh, I noticed that everybody had a picture of uh, of their hometown. Yeah, so Amsterdam uh, tends to look like this. This is actually a view that was also painted by Monet, but uh, the painting looks looks quite different. But I didn't have time to look it up <laughs> anymore. But anyways, this is Amsterdam. Uh, well, let's talk about research actually. So here's uh, here's what I study. I have uh, just like Johannes actually. Uh, I have a, a trapped ion and I hold it in a cloud of atoms. And, uh, and the main difference with uh, what Johannes was talking about is that my atoms are actually not uh, rubidium, but, but lithium, um, which means uh, actually that they are fermionic. So, um, uh, and we will see in my talk that uh, this leads to a few uh, uh, differences. And uh, yeah, let me just get into it. Yeah, so we. Uh, there had been, uh, Johannes was talking a lot about his uh, very nice uh, quantum chemistry results. And uh, yeah, I would, when I started looking into these atoms and ion combinations, I had mostly in mind uh, studying uh, quantum physics of interacting atoms and ions. And in particular, I was intrigued uh, back then and still am <laughs> of the fact that if you take a single ion, it is basically a harmonic oscillator that you can control very well. And the reason is that, that any ion that, uh, that we choose, uh, whether it's barium or, or in our case, it's ytterbium, we can usually define um, a two level system in it. Uh, yeah, like a qubit. Huh? And uh, uh, yeah, that actually means that, uh, that the trapped ion system combines two of our favorite uh, uh, quantum models, namely the harmonic oscillator and the two-level system. And uh, yeah, this guy has, has shown um, that if you uh, now combine this with laser interactions, that you can actually control the internal state and the motion of the ion uh, to, yeah, to kind of arbitrary degree, yeah? meaning that you can make any state of motion um, and, uh, and spin uh, or qubit alike, and you can also measure those. And uh, yeah, so Dave Weinland got the Nobel Prize actually in 2012, not in 2013. So that's an error in my slide that I notice each time that I show it, but I somehow <laughs> I always forget to fix it. Okay. Um, yeah, so now what, what I have in mind is taking this beautiful quantum system and based, basically plugging it into another beautiful quantum system, namely uh, degenerate Fermi gas. And if we take two spin components, then this uh, gas of ultra cold atoms is, uh, is a very nice system of its own. Uh, yeah, because we can usually tune the interactions between the particles to be either uh, repulsive or attractive. Now on the attractive side, uh, you get an ultra cold uh, cloud of, uh, of fermions. And on the repulsive side, you can actually make uh, both Einstein condensate of, of uh, of molecular atoms. Yeah, so my question is what happens if I now introduce an ion into this system? And of course, 
you can think of very many things that you can study. Yeah? So the ion is basically a polaron that goes into a gas uh, of, of polarizable atoms here. So it has to do, so with the central spin problem, I have a spin system here that I put into a system of other spins. Quantum chaos could occur that we could study. And we could study what happens to the ion as we cross this, uh, um, this point here, uh, going from the BC to the BCS side, whether you get quantum chemistry, etc. Now, today I will not go into uh, uh, all these fancy things because we haven't done them yet. But what we did look at is uh, buffer gas cooling. Yeah? So the question is, if you take the ion and you plug it in, how cold can you get? So I will be obsessed today with this question. How cold can I make this system? Um, yeah, so let me leave it at this. So um, yeah, so here are our, 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 yeah, this, this is, let's say, the vision and of, of what we would have in the end of what the system would look like. So you could take multiple ions, then you get uh, phonons in, the, in this ion crystal, sound waves that are quantized, and they would then couple to the fermionic atoms in the bath. And of course, this looks a little bit like a solid state system, eh, where now the atoms are like the electrons, uh, let's say. And a major question actually is whether we can find Feshbach resonances between atoms and ions. And I had to last minute uh, change my slide because actually today our uh, friends and colleagues in uh, Freiburg put a paper on the archive uh, showing um, uh, actually pretty convincing uh, uh, Feshbach uh, resonances. So I was, uh, in I have to admit, uh, uh, Johannes, I was also reading this paper a little bit in between, uh, in, in between your talk. Yeah? So this looks, uh, looks very nice. Okay, so why am I so obsessed with making uh, atoms and ions cold? Well, uh, Johannes also mentioned this already a bit, that uh, the ion is, of course, trapped in a pole trap. And also, by the way, uh, uh, Sadiq, uh, yesterday in his talk, um, was mentioning the micro-motion of the ion. So when you take an ion in a pole trap, uh, it's sitting in an oscillating field, uh, which means that, uh, that when it collides with the atom, it, it never quite thermalizes. Yeah? So if you take a cloud of atoms uh, and the ion is interacting with it, then the ion temperature will never become the same as the atom temperature. And it will in general be uh, much higher. And I mean, like really much higher. Yeah? So even at uh, zero temperature, the ions can, can reach many millikelvins or even tens or hundreds of millikelvin of energy. Now, since this is a time-dependent uh, problem, it's hard, yeah? and people have worked, especially on the theory of this, uh, quite a lot, actually, also uh, Matthias. Yeah? There's a paper by Matthias also here. Um, and uh, yeah, and, and we kind of have our, let's say, uh, our own kind of approach to it, because, um, yeah, what we, what we thought is, uh, how can you prevent this? And, uh, and this type of, heating mechanism that causes the ion to be so much hotter than the atoms. And uh, see Marco Cetina back in 2012, when he was working at MIT, he figured out that, that the, the mass ratio between the atoms and the ions is, uh, is extremely important. Yeah? So he calculated that if you want to go to a regime where both the atoms and ions, and their interaction between them behave quantum mechanically, then you can only do so if you take very heavy ions and very light atoms. So based on this, we, we then started building an experiment that is based on six lithium and uh, 171 ytterbium. Yeah? Okay, so that was basically the introduction. Uh, let me now get to how you would actually build such a system. Now, uh, back then I was in uh, mines when I uh, started building this experiment. So the first thing I did actually was take the train to, uh, to Heidelberg, which is not so far away, um, to find out how pe people there actually uh, work with lithium. And Salem Joachim, who I think will give a talk tomorrow, was quite helpful in, in, uh, in, in showing me how, how you should do this. Yeah? So uh, what you see here is a drawing of our experimental setup. So what we have here is the same on slower that we uh, 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 the drawing of with which we got from uh, Salim. 
And uh, yeah, here the atoms uh, come out and they get slowed. And then here at my laser pointer, we make a magneto optical trap. And uh, here you see our ion trap, which is a big chunky ion trap. And then the atoms here are in this uh, mod. Uh, and it's actually a mirror mod. Yeah, so this is a mirror. So we just need four laser beams to make a cloud of atoms here. Then you see a lot of copper here, and that's for all the coils we need. Yeah? Because we need to, if you want to make lithium cold, you need high magnetic fields to reach the Feshbach resonances. So here you see a picture of the ion crystal that we have. So that's inside this ion trap. Here's a picture of the lithium cloud. Okay, so here's a cross section now. So let me run you through this experimental procedure. Yeah? So here, so we trap some ions. Yeah? So we both ionize some terbium atoms. And then we can cool it. So this is the ethereum level scheme. It's nothing to really worry about. Uh, here you have a picture of these ions. So the ions are here, but the atoms actually they form here. So here comes the cloud of the, the beam from the Zeeman slower. We make a magneto optical trap, which looks like this. And then we compress it and do all the kind of the laser cooling uh, trickery yeah, that, uh, that you have to figure out. And then, yeah, we get a pretty a uh, compressed cloud of atoms uh, that is pretty cold actually. And then we trap it in a magnetic trap. So switch off all the, all the light. Um, and we have a magnetic field zero that we then transport up to where the ions is. Um, yeah, and, uh, but actually uh, when you do this, let me just go one slide back. Uh, actually you lose some atoms from the, from the electrodes. So it heats up a bit. So it turns out that we're not cold enough to do evaporative cooling. Um, so, uh, sorry, I go in the wrong direction. Yeah, so once the atoms are up, yeah, uh, now you see a cross section of the pole trap looking from the top, then we do another magneto optical trap. So we compress the atoms again, then we shine in a, an optical dipole trap through the tips of the pole trap here to trap the atoms here. And we ramp up the field to, uh, to about uh, uh, 750 Gauss. Uh, which, which is close to the Feshbach resonance, and then the atoms start colliding. And then we evaporatively cool down the atoms in about two seconds. Um, yeah, here you see the power in the dipole trap, yeah, so we reduce it, and here you see the temperature of the atoms. So it's cold then. Okay, and then the situation we have is as follows. We have one trapped ethereum ion, and then we have a cloud of uh, lithium atoms below it. So the optical dipole trap is not at the same location as the, as the ion. And then we have uh, piezo mirrors that, uh, uh, you know, a mirror with piezos on it, that, 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 such that with the voltage, we can just slightly tilt them. And then in this way, we can transport up this cloud of atoms. And then, uh, yeah, and then let it interact with the ion. Um, and then we release the atoms. So we, we generally don't look at the atoms because we have pretty poor optical access and there's not a lot uh, to see actually, only that there's a cloud of atoms um, and, and some rough numbers. Um, and then we actually look at the ion. So what we do is we want to know how, how cold the ion is. So what we do for this is uh, we borrow some tricks from, uh, from, the, from the quantum people, you know, the, the people who want to make quantum computers. And uh, uh, yeah, and their uh, thermometry uh, is, is used quite a bit, and this is usually how it's done. Um, we drive a transition here. You notice it's a quadrupole transition. We go from S to D, so it's, it's not uh, allowed, huh, this transition, so it's narrow. And then um, what you know uh, if you're in the, well, close to the Lambdicke regime, is that the coupling strength on this transition depends slightly on the, on the, the number of quanta in the harmonic oscillator of the ion. Yeah, so the, this is the Lambdicke per parameter eta, and this is the number of quanta. And of course, if you have a thermal state of motion, then, uh, then you have a distribution of n. Uh, so yeah, yeah, then what you, will, uh, uh, yeah, what you will see is that you will get Rabi flops if you're in a pure state. But if you're in a thermal state, then the Rabi flops will deface. I will show you this in a moment. There's one thing to worry about in the ethereum. You have um, um, that the D state decays to the F state, uh, which lives for 60 years, and uh, part of it decays back. 
uh, which means that we will never get full contrast in these Rabi flops because 70, 17% decays back. Okay, but that's a detail. Uh, and then we can detect in the end uh, whether the ion is in the S or in the F state. Okay. So this is what it looks like. So there's a lot in this plot. So let me run you through it. So initially, the ion is uh, quite hot uh, because it's only Doppler cooled. Um, and actually, the Doppler limit is about uh, 500 microkelvin here. And you see that the uh, Rabi flops that we take, yeah, I mean, yeah, they don't look so nice. Huh? Um, and that's because there are many uh, emotional states occupied. So these, uh, there are many Rabi frequencies, so it dephases. Yeah? And uh, you see then, as we keep this ion in the cloud of atoms, and uh, then you see that uh, the Rabi flops improve, so it gets colder. And from fitting this, we can obtain the, the, the temperature of the ion. Okay. So the ion has micromotion, so temperature is not so, so easily defined. Yeah, but I'll get back to this in, in a moment. Uh, but you see it goes from the Doppler limit uh, down to, let's say, uh, 100 microkelvin. Yeah? So we have reduced the energy by a factor of five. So the black line is a fit. Uh, the, the dotted line here is what you would expect if the ion would be in a time-independent trap but it's not, huh? so the micromotion still plays a role. So you see that you have some offset here. And then you also see the dashed line, which is uh, based on, uh, on our theory, including the, the time dependence of the pole trap. So you see that we're a bit higher than we would expect, and there can be several reasons for this now. Okay, but uh, this is actually the first time that, uh, that buffer gas cooling has outperformed uh, simple uh, laser cooling. Yeah? Because uh, up until now, the ion would always heat up uh, when, once you put it in a cloud of atoms. So that's quite nice. Um, so what do we get in the end? So on average, you have about six quanta of motion. And the secular uh, temperature is about 100 microkelvin. Secular means that I don't take the micromotion into account here. So uh, after we got these results, we of course tried to get colder and colder. And uh, this is uh, the coldest results we got. Now you have to imagine that since the ion is in a time dependent uh, trap, you have the micro motion and uh, um, you actually have to uh, measure the amount of micro motion it has in order to determine the total kinetic energy of the ion. So that's what we did here. There are all kinds of micromotion. I, I don't really have time to go into this now, but we measured them all. And then we get the total energy of the ion. Um, actually, we also have an atomic energy. So in this case, the cloud of atoms was 2.3 microkelvin. Then when you add it all up, you can calculate the collision energy between the atom and ion. And, uh, and yeah, and it turns out that if you do this, you end up at roughly one times the S wave energy. Um, yeah, so that means that the that the collisions between the atoms and ions uh, only have have basically a single or perhaps two units of uh, angular momentum in them. Yeah, so so we're very close to the S wave limit, uh, as uh, as people working in cold atoms also uh, uh, have it uh, with uh, collisions between atoms. So now the question is, can we see some quantum effects in the collisions between the atoms and ions, and then to check this, we decided to look at spin exchange. So here you see a picture of the ground state of ytterbium and the ground state of lithium. Uh, so what we do is uh, we prepare the ytterbium here in, in an excited, let's say, spin state. And uh, now the idea is that if it collides with an atom, then most collisions conserve the total spin. Yeah? So if the, if the ion drops down here, then the atoms go up by one spin unit. And now we can detect this spin exchange. And uh, yeah, you would expect if atoms and ions collide that, uh, that the rate at which the spin exchange occurs should be independent of, uh, of the collision energy uh, uh, when we are dealing with the classical system at least because, uh, because uh, they are Langevin uh, collisions. Yeah? Uh, well, I mean, it doesn't have to be uh, quite independent, but, uh, but we should at least see once the quantum effects start to occur, uh, we should see uh, a pattern in this, uh, 
uh, in this uh, spin exchange as a function of the uh, collision energy. So that's what we did. And uh, yeah, so in the end, we can detect uh, whether a spin exchange has occurred. So we had a look at this, and this is what we measure. So we changed the collision energy of the ion by giving it more or less uh, micro motion. And then you see here the spin exchange. And uh, yeah, so we measured this. We were not quite sure what, uh, what to do with it. So we asked our theory friends, uh, Mihal Tomsa and uh, Harek Piater, uh, to help us understand this data. And they fitted it. And from this, we got uh, the scattering lengths uh, between the uh, atoms and, and ions. Yeah, so we got a singlet and a triplet scattering length. OK. So let me briefly check time. It's also for my benefit because I have to teach afterwards. So I'm sorry, Jesus, that I cannot actually hear your talk. But uh, yeah, okay, let me continue then. Um, yeah, so this is based on the fit. Uh, here you see the partial waves, S, P, D, F uh, waves in the collision. And uh, this is our best fit. Uh, you, so you see, we were already pretty sure that they were opposite, the singlet and triplet scattering length. Uh, and now we're quite sure that, uh, well, almost completely sure that, that the singlet is, uh, is positive and the triplet is, uh, is negative. They're both large. Yeah? So they're on the order of the natural unit of uh, interaction length scale between the atom and the ion. So I see some questions in the, in the chat. So if you okay. cannot wait with the questions, then, then please say so, because I cannot simultaneously read it. Uh, it's up to you, Rene, uh, okay. whether you want to take the questions now or you want to leave it for the end. No, perhaps I'll leave it for the end then. Yeah? Okay. Then I will, sure. then I will no continue. Problem. Yeah? Okay. <clears throat> so where are we now? Huh? In, in, uh, because I, I had uh, kind of this dream of having a, having a quantum system of atoms and ions. And uh, yeah, so yeah, so what... Uh, well, yeah, what I once did is I, I, I have drawn this kind of phase diagram of, of the system that I'm looking at. Huh? So here on the x-axis, you have the ion energy. So we measured uh, roughly 200 uh, microkelvin here huh? in, in, the, in the results I was just showing. And here I have the atom energy. And now you see these, uh, these kind of lines correspond to the, the partial wave limits in the collisions between the atoms and ions. Yeah? So you see where right at the edge of the S wave limit. But, but that's, that's actually the only thing that is quantum ab about it, yeah? because uh, you see the, the ion motion is not really quantized. Yeah, I was showing that we had like six quanta of motion still in the ion. And also the atoms were actually a classical gas. So we were very far away from, um, well, we were like a factor 10 away from the degenerate Fermi gas or the, or the BEC yeah, that you can actually also make. So in the remainder of the talk, I would like to explore a little bit what you could expect as you go down and how you could get there and what will be the ultimate limits. Okay. But yeah, so let's focus on, on this one. So, um, so okay. On this side of this, uh, of this phase diagram of the atoms, we are dealing with the BEC of molecules. And one thing we are wondering actually is what, what will happen when the ion collides with the molecules. So these are Feshbach molecules, which means that they are huge, yeah? they're really large molecules. Like it can be like a hundred nanometer uh, big. So they're, and they are, yeah, I think, I think it's fair to say that they are probably uh, a lot bigger than any other molecule. And that we normally deal with. So, uh, so this is kind of an interesting regime because if you change the magnetic field, you can even change the, the size of, the, of these molecules. So we want to understand what happens. So let's have a look. So we did some simulations actually together with Jesus. Um, uh, it's published here. So the next speaker actually. Uh, and uh, my PhD student, Hendrik, did some simulations. Yeah, so now the idea is I have an ion in a pole trap and it's colliding with, uh, uh, with, uh, with a gas of lithium-2 molecules. Now, as a function of B field, since these are Feshbach molecules, I can change the size of these, uh, of these molecules. Yeah, you see this here, that's the B field. 
and also the binding energy. And here's the size actually. And uh, yeah, what has always intrigued me is that there is a crossover. So you can imagine that, that there is a typical range of interaction between the atoms and ions, which we always call uh, R star or R4. And uh, it's given by this formula where C4 is the polarizability of the atoms. And yeah, the size of the Feschbach resonance and this range of interactions becomes the same at about 704 Gauss. So what actually, <laughs> what will happen there? Um, so this is how we envision it. Yeah? So you will have an ion, and if you have deeply bound Feschbach molecules, then they are very small. And uh, yeah, so the ion will collide with uh, molecules. But as I change the magnetic field, these molecules get bigger. So there must be some kind of smooth transition from having ions colliding with molecules to ions colliding with atoms. So what happens? So, um, so we did the simulations. So this is not data. We are actually taking data uh, right now, but I don't dare to show it yet because it's too preliminary. Um, yeah, so we find that uh, at this uh, point, at this field where, we, where you go from, uh, where this kind of range of interactions between the atoms and the ions becomes as large as the molecules, we see a diff uh, we should expect a different outcome in the uh, experiment. Yeah? So if the molecules are deeply bound, we see that uh, in the calculations that what should happen is that the ytterbium steals one of the lithium atoms from the other one. Yeah, so you get a, you should get a molecular ion that will probably not live very long. Eh? Like what Johannes was just showing, he had lifetimes of like milliseconds. So that's what we should also expect. Uh, but if the molecule is large, and then the ytterbium will break it up. So you see that the outcome will be that, that you get ytterbium plus and two lithium atoms. So that's something that we are now studying in the lab. Now, this is all classical, these simulations. We should expect quantum effects actually to play a role because the collision energy is on the order of the S-wave limit. But uh, this is a much harder problem to solve theoretically. So we will first look at what we get in the, in the lab. Okay. Now, of course, we want to get cold. Huh? So we want to go that way. How to do it? Well, what is, I think, instructive is to once look at uh, what collision energy we have reached in the experiments so far. Now, since the ion is much heavier than the atom, uh, actually the uh, collision energy is, uh, is to a large extent given by the atomic energy, although the ion is much hotter. Yeah? So this is a bit confusing, but, but once you get over it, <laughs> you, you can get used to it. Yeah? So if you look here, you see that this cloud of uh, atoms um, um, at two microkelvin roughly gives you a quarter of the collision energy here. And the other bits are given by the energy of the ion. Uh, and most of it here is the so-called secular energy. So that's the number of quanta in the harmonic oscillator. And then there's also the excess micromotion. Okay, so there are three directions of motion, y, x, and, and let's say the axial, and that's the long direction of the pole trap. And it turns out this is the biggest chunk along the axis of the pole trap. Why is this? Well, we are dealing with a background heating rate. So the ions actually, because of electric field noise, they slowly heat up, roughly the number you would expect for the type of pole trap that we have. And uh, yeah, this heating effect is competing with, uh, with, uh, uh, with the, uh, buffer gas cooling, uh, so you end up at the higher temperature. So we think we, well, there are two ways of, of reducing this. You, you should get rid of the electric field noise, which will probably be hard, or you have to increase the density of the cloud. Yeah? So that's, uh, that's probably what we, what we would do by adding a laser, so it's that you get a dimple, and then uh, the density goes up and the buffer gas cooling becomes more efficient. Uh, so we expect to get a factor of two, which of course it's a log scale, so it's not, not really a lot yet. Yeah, uh, so what else can we do? Well, of course you can make the atoms colder. Yeah? We only went to two microkelvin. It should be possible to take them like a factor of 10 uh, lower in temperature. Um, yeah, but then we, we should evaporate a bit more efficiently because especially at the end, uh, we're kind of, yeah, I mean, it, yeah, it's, it's not great. I mean. Basically, we have such a dilute gas. So I was just doing the calculation after Johannes, well, in Johannes' talk. Uh, I think we are a factor um, 
uh, like uh, 1,000 to 10,000 less dense than in his uh, in his uh, cloud of atoms. Uh, yeah, now yeah, I think roughly 1,000. And uh, so we would actually like to have a denser gas. Yeah? So of course the advantage is that that we don't have to care so much about three body effects up until now. But uh, let's see how this will go in the future. Um, okay, so. If we get a colder gas, of course, we go to the degenerate Fermi gas. Also, the ion should get colder, uh, but there are also limitations here. So we expect perhaps uh, also, yeah, perhaps a factor of two, perhaps a little bit more. So we go close to this kind of deep quantum regime yeah, that I, this name I invented myself. But anyways, <laughs> okay. Uh, there's uh, excess micromotion, which we can probably compensate better. That's errors in the pole trap. Uh, production errors mostly. So we think we can probably improve still a little bit, but not really a lot. Perhaps a factor of two, yeah, so we get close. Um, then actually, uh, one thing that I was also wondering is that if you take a pole trap, of course, there, it, it just has two values that, uh, that operate it. Eh? You have a voltage that you put on the electrodes, and then you have a frequency at which you oscillate these frequencies. And uh, I think it, a relevant question is, could you actually optimize a little bit by choosing the right voltages and frequencies? And uh, so we did some more simulations because it's easier to simulate than to measure um, at, uh, at the data taking a uh, rate that, uh, that we have. Um, so, and then my student, uh, Eleanor, did some simulations and it turns out, yeah, there should be something to gain here. Yeah? So, so the, the data I was showing was taken here. And uh, and actually, we would expect that if we lower the voltage on the on the, uh, the electrodes of the of the pole trap, which are given by the Q parameter, that's typical ion trapping lingo here. But yeah, then we can do a little bit better. And also, now we had uh, for the coldest results, we had like four quanta of motion. We should go to roughly one according to theory. Yeah? So uh, yeah, so that. That should gain uh, a lot. That actually is interesting because it makes uh, buffer gas cooling uh, competitive now with subdoppler cooling techniques as well. Uh, actually, changing the frequency of the pole trap. So we are using this frequency. Uh, so it, perhaps we can gain a little bit depending on uh, now uh, how much uh, errors we have in the pole trap, how much micro motion here, excess micro motion. But uh, it seems by lucky coincidence, we almost landed on the, on the, on the correct spot. Yeah? So not much to gain there. Okay. Mm. So yeah, uh, yeah, that's, that's my talk. Yeah, so we're, uh, these, uh, uh, the final results I was showing were a little bit theoretical. So we're in the lab now, uh, trying to, uh, to, to find these lower temperatures and also look at these interactions between the ions and the and the Feshbach molecules. Uh, yeah, so this is the team. Um, actually, I want to mention Jesus, who I think will give the next talk. And, uh, and also Mihao Tomza uh, helped us a lot with this, uh, with uh, understanding uh, this uh, system. Okay, so if you have questions, uh, then go ahead. Right. And I will read the chat perhaps in the meantime. Yeah, uh, so thank you very much for this lovely talk. And um, yeah, we are open for questions. Uh, do people want to start by asking? Um, so we can go in sequence with of the chat. Rohit, do you want to start by asking a question? I, I, I have read the question. Now I can also answer this. Right, uh, fine. Yeah, we did not put the mod at the same spot as the iron trap because we were afraid that uh, that the lithium atoms will start coating the electrodes of the of the ion trap, and then the problem is that uh, the lithium, even in vacuum, will start to uh, oxidize slowly, and then it's no longer conducting, and then uh, electrons can sit on it, and uh, and these cause electric fields that will push the ion outside of out out of the center of the, the pole trap, and then you get excess micro motion, um, and. Uh, uh, yeah, so we wanted to avoid this. So we wanted to keep the mod away from the uh, from the ions. Yeah, but I mean, looking back, I, I guess I mean perhaps that has been a mistake because 
because in the end, uh, it uh, especially this transport step, taking the atoms up and then recooling them in the second mod, etc. It and uh, yeah, this turned out to be actually quite complicated because uh, we have spent like like huge amounts of times uh, getting this working. Yeah? So uh, uh, yeah, so the system has become a little bit too complex. So perhaps in the end, I should have done it differently, but. Of course, my colleagues, uh, and I think also Johannes has this uh, situation, is they usually have a cloud of atoms that is that is really far away from the from the ions. Then they prepare a cold sample and then they transport it up. So I decided to go kind of halfway, you know, have a like a pretty cold sample and then transport it up and then do the final evaporation at the ion. So yeah, I don't know. I think you could, could argue about this. Um, yeah, yeah. Sorry, it, uh, I I did not mean that ion cooling uh, by collisions has been shown before. I mean, this of course. I mean, when laser cooling did not exist, I mean, you could only. Uh, so I'm answering the next question now. Um, uh, I mean, people have been doing this, of course, since the 60s, right? I mean, doing buffer gas cooling. What I meant was that uh, uh, that the buffer gas cooling in my uh, lab uh, outperformed. Doppler cooling, and I think that was a that was the first time. Unless you know another example, I, I mean, I do not. You want to perhaps react? Or? Yeah, yeah, okay, so that's fine. Yeah, thanks for that. Question. Yeah, yeah, no, sorry, I, uh, for sure. I mean, uh, Hans Demelt was already uh, working on uh, ions okay. colliding with uh, gas of atoms and even doing calculations. But perhaps I, I I phrased it a bit in a clumsy way. Yeah, then I apologize. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, um, what will be the experimental signature of S-wave scattering? Yeah, so so in principle, uh, uh, if you look at launch event collisions, which is the, the main kind of cooling mechanism between atoms and ions, that means there's a hardcore collision between the atoms uh, and the ions. Um, in principle, the rate of this should be independent of energy, if you're talking about uh, free particles, of course. Um, and uh, uh, and in the case of S-wave collisions, uh, this is also the case. It should be independent of the energy of the two particles, but uh, but the rate itself will be different. So that's what we were trying to look for in these these spin changing collisions that also depend on on uh, on, uh, on on uh, on the uh, on the launch event collisions. Now, the better way to do it in the end will be to look at S, uh, at Feshbach resonances. Yeah? So today, if you're into this atom ion uh, business, then check the archive today. Yeah? There's a beautiful reprint by the by our friends in uh, Freiburg uh, where they show Feshbach resonances for the first time. Now, and these you can start to fit. And then once you fit those, then you can, uh, you can assign the resonances to quantum numbers and also to angular momentum quantum numbers in the collisions, and then you can show it's only S wave. So that will be in the end, the real signature. So we only showed in this, in this paper now that, uh, that, there is a, that there are quantum effects. So you see this wiggly thing in the, in the charge exchange. Okay, that's quantum effects. Let's put it like this. Uh, what would you have changed if you would have considered atom and ions of same species, yeah. So I I am not interested in that, to be honest. Because if I use the same species, I have two choices. I can either uh, uh, choose uh, uh, an ion of an alkali atom, yeah, but that doesn't have internal states. I mean, it's like a helium atom, you know. I mean, that's there's nothing you can basically uh, 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 do with it. It doesn't have a qubit, you know. It's uh, yeah, so that's not really my my cup of tea. So, so I, I prefer not to do this. The other option would be to have an earth alkali atom, but I think uh, those are very hard uh, to work with. Of course, in Amsterdam, uh, Florian Streck is working with strontium atoms, but uh, yeah. So, but I'm more of an ion trapper, I guess. So I'm not. Yeah, I don't want to do too complicated <laughs> atom stuff, uh, to be honest. But. Uh, yeah. So yeah, but I, okay. Let's put it like this. I mean, we can, of course, we have. Uh, I did not show this, but we have also um, 
we can also make Rietberg uh, lithium atoms, which means that we can also ionize them, the lithium atoms. So we could perhaps potentially in the future ones look at lithium plus and, and lithium, uh, uh, like you, Sadiq, but then of course we have lithium uh, six. But, uh, but yeah, I think probably not. I think, I mean, we prefer to trap ions, I guess. So, so uh, yeah, there's enough to do, I think. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, uh, yeah. So I think um, we are running out of time. I, I mean, I, I do regret perhaps not having used barium, especially when I see the results <laughs> today. Yeah? So, so perhaps barium would have been a better choice for the iron. But anyways, yeah. So yeah, I think we have run out of time. Thank you very much, Rene, for this lovely talk. Yes.